Good morning, church. Good morning. Are you ready? Yes. Oh, I like that. That's wonderful. That is so fantastic. I'm really excited about what's happening as well as we are. Uh, last week was kind of a upper story, lower story concept that prepared us for the next weeks to come as we uh, go through the Bible. And uh, what a great opportunity that is. Um, most Christians in the church have not read through the entire Bible from cover to cover. And so what we're going to be doing in the next weeks is that we're going to be going through the Bible. And I'll talk a little bit more about that during the message time. Uh, and it's, a, it's actually chronological and it has narrations in the middle. So it kind of, kind of moves in continuity the, the scriptures as we go through it. It's not to replace the Bible. And I'll say that again later. Uh, it is just to help us go through and see how, how that works and so on. So excited about that. There are small groups that have been forming. Uh, I got a contact from Oklahoma, someone that's not related to uh, uh, this church other than it's a family member of mine, cousin, uh, that says, can we be part of your small group? And that's gonna be pretty interesting to have them um, uh, via computer uh, through Zoom. It's going to be neat. So uh, there is an outline for you to to, uh, to look at here. Uh, and then I just want to put a plug in for uh, Ash Wednesday this Wednesday. I know it's Valentine's Day and I can't think of a greater love that we're going to be celebrating, but it is. it feels conflicting, doesn't it? Ash Wednesday, Valentine's Day. Um, that's the way the schedules fall. So at 6 o'clock, we have our Ash Wednesday service. Um, I will be here fairly early that morning uh, if there is someone that has a work day and would like to have the imposition of ashes, whether it's on your forehead or on your wrist or hand, uh, but I'll have that all ready. Uh, the ashes from last Palm Sunday are going to be burned today as I prepare those uh, for us. We have some that we bought, but I like to do that. So I want to encourage you to do that. Also, the Sweetheart Dance, it's coming up on the 16th. It's $8 at the door, and we're really starting to load up. It looks like it's going to be a super success. And I thank those people that have been helping, getting ready to transform our uh, multi-purpose room gymnasium to a winter wonderland, is what they're saying. So I'm, I'm excited to see that. Uh, let's see. Are there any other announcements? All right, then. We'll go ahead and have our, our opening hymn, which is How Great Thou Art, and we'll process with the cross. <laughs> Oh 
the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Bible says, therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Prepare your hearts for confession. Holy and gracious God, from the time of the fall, all of mankind has been saturated with sin, and I am saturated as well. On my own, I have no hope of being pure. My only hope is to turn to the one who alone is able to make me clean. It is with that certainty that I confess that I have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what I have done and by what I have not done. Some of my sin I know, the thoughts and the words and the deeds of which I am ashamed. But some is known only to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, Savior, I ask forgiveness and pray for you to deliver and restore me by your mercy. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has a plan. And he's had it all along. His son came down, leaving his heavenly home, to make a way for God to have mercy on you. He has given to all of us his only son to suffer and die for our salvation. As a called, ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, Bring it to the completion of the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And God's people said, Amen. A hymn of praise shall follow the words of forgiveness. You may be seated. Let us pray. 
prayer. Blessed Lord, from the beginning you planned to be in relationship with your creation. Since you have caused all Holy Scripture to be written for our learning, grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. This we pray through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. He lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for our readings today. Our reading comes to us from Genesis chapter 1, the first four verses. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. This is the word of the Lord. A responsive psalm today has men and women separately responding, as well as all people together. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scholars, but that his light is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. To what lengths will God go to make sure the relationship is steadfast? We hear from St. Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 5. For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who might, or those who live, might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Alleluia. Please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 16th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. It's not only in the book of Matthew that we find the Great Commission. Mark also speaks on this in Mark chapter 16. Afterward, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at table, and he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Be seated, and those who would like to be part of the children, 
Those children that would like to be part of the children. I know you're all children of God. I. <laughs> Choose my words wisely. My goodness. <laughs> good morning, good morning, good morning. Doing good today? You all got shiny stuff on today. I noticed that. Got beautiful sandals, beautiful bedazzled boots, and sheen-like slippers and shoes. Those are awesome. Very nice. I have a question for you, and I think you might be able to answer it. I don't know how you're going to answer it. Sometimes I ask questions, and I don't know how you're going to answer it. If someone says you're smart, what does that mean? Boy, you're smart. Why might someone say that? Hmm. Now, you're in school, right? You get pretty good grades. You get some A's. Dad, does he get? Does she get some A's? Yeah, super good. Yeah. Well, you're smart. Yeah. It's cold outside this morning. Did you wear a coat? Boy, you are so smart. Did you get a good night's sleep? <laughs> good. You're smart. That might be more smart. Another thing, I, I, and this is a, a saying I haven't heard for a long time. Sometimes when people are doing something, they go, ow, oh, that's smart. That's kind of, maybe you haven't heard that, but that's a different meaning. That kind of means that hurts. That kind of something. In church, why and how would someone be called smart in church? What would be some of the things that they either know or they do that you say, boy, that's smart. But maybe some things. I almost heard you. Learning about Jesus. It's smart to come to church and learn about Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, you can be smart. Or if you know that Jesus loves you, that's smart. Now, I got one more definition of smart. And it's maybe a, not quite as nice as have anyone, have you ever heard anybody being called, boy, you're a smarty? Whoa. <laughs> and what does that, do you think that means? It means that you're really a good person and smart? Or does that mean like you're kind of being, oh, I don't know, a uh, little talkish. You're kind of saying things that maybe makes someone not feel as good anymore. Isn't it that? You're being a smarty today, a smart Alec. Well, guess what I had today? I am smarty. All right. And what I'm thinking today is to be smart about Jesus. Smart in your decisions in your school and at home with your friends. And when you play, you make smart decisions. Like what would Jesus do? Because that's how you'd be smart. It's smart to know in your mind that Jesus died on the cross to take away my sins. It's also really smart to have him in your heart. So today, that's it. The message is... Being smart about your faith and your walk, coming to church, learning about Jesus, praying at home, always being a smarty in a good way, okay? So let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for making me know Jesus. Thank you for making me know Jesus and help me to tell others about Jesus. Amen. All right. Here you go. You know what? There's a lot of little candies in here, and I'm not going to ask you to tell about 15 people. But if you give, take one of these, you can give it to one person. You have to tell them something about Jesus, right? And you can eat the other yourself, all right, if you take two. Mm -hmm. All right, you know what? Here you go. Go ahead and take one or two. You take one, that means you're just taking one, and that's all right. Here you go. Oh. Three, just noting the little one took three. Yeah. He's got to tell two people. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and if anybody else would like to tell someone about Jesus and would like the Smarties, see me after church. We'll take care of you. How shall they hear 
who have not heard is our sermon hymn for the day. Savior Jesus Christ to each and every one of you. Amen. God creates and he loves. I remember when I was very young, I was had Bibles that were given us to use in our Sunday school, and they were children's books. They weren't quite the same as the ones the grown-ups got to use. But I remember one morning I was in the house and it was a, I think it was in the summertime and I was walking by the bookshelf and I was looking at a book and it was a really neat book and I knew what it was. It was a Bible. And I, it, and I looked at it and it was like I needed to open it. I sensed that there was something I needed to know. I was, I was very young. It's almost like I heard it kind of breathing and I, and, and I walked by it. And I knew that it was special. It wasn't a children's book. It didn't have that many pictures. And I would take it off the shelf and I would lay on the floor and I would tuck my palms under my hands and my chin and I would prop up my legs and I would open the book and I would try to read it. And I remember the pages <clears throat> felt so thin. And I remember someone telling me, oh, that's onion leaf paper. And I kept at it, looking at the words and, and trying to read it oh, for probably about 10 minutes or so. And then I kind of surrendered with a sigh and I you know, put it back on the shelf and went about my day. I read it, but I, I didn't get it. And apparently I'm not alone. Reading long sections of the Bible is tough, let alone reading through the entire Bible. Statistics show that the average family, and I, I really didn't have time to double check this statistic, it says the average family owns almost four Bibles in every household, which 
I just, I don't know about today. I got to check that date. But 41% of those people confess that they've never read it. Maybe you can relate. The Bible is the one book on the shelf that collects a whole lot of dust. Research tells us that most people, not just people who go to church, but most people have read through the Bible on their bucket list. They want to accomplish this before they kick the bucket, and hence it seems to be right up there with climbing some high mountain like Mount Everest or going skydiving. Maybe that's even easier for some to accomplish. This story of the Bible will, if it hasn't already, well, no, I would say even if it has, it will continue to change your life. And once you see that story, once you experience it over and over again, you're going to see those changes. The story, the experience, it is meant to open up and, and unravel and expose and, and, I guess, bring to light Things that perhaps you've never seen before in your life. God has been telling the story throughout all of history. And this, this book that if you don't already have it, I strongly recommend that you get it. Seriously discounted rate of, of 10 bucks for this in the study guide. It goes through and it, it has opportunities to do it. In the back of the book is pretty remarkable too. It, it actually aligns all the chapters with the books of the Bible that the chapters are talking about. In my copy, I put all the verses and so forth at the beginning of each chapter so I know where in Scripture this chapter would be drawn from. Now, as I said earlier, this is not designed to replace the Bible. That's not what we're doing here. It's a gateway, perhaps, to the Bible. It moves things around and it reads like a novel. For example, it takes the heartfelt confession of King David in Psalm 51 when he says, A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. And it links it right after Nathan confronts David about the great sin that he committed with Bathsheba, killing, making sure Uriah was murdered, and now that broken and contrite heart kind of jumps off the page. I think it's important to see that this isn't a bunch of unrelated stories that the Bible has, that it all has a purpose. It was Moses at the end of his life, in Deuteronomy 31, if you have your Bibles, you can open up to Deuteronomy 39. It's verses 9 through 13, but just so you can mark it in your notes if you're keeping notes. So Moses wrote down this law and he gave it to the Levitical priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant. Then Moses commanded them, at the end of every seven years, in the year of canceling debts during the festival of tabernacles, when all of Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God at the place he will choose, you shall read this law before them in their hearing. Assemble the people, men, women, children, and foreigners residing in your towns so that they can listen and learn and fear the Lord your God and follow carefully all the words of his law. Their children who do not know this law but must hear it and learn it to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land you are crossing the Jordan to possess. Every seven years, Israel was to get together, men, women, children, even outsiders, and read what they would say was all the Bible, their law that they had. Why? Well, not so that they could just be smarter, but so that they could live the story. That phrase used, fear God, which simply means you need to know God's story, hold him in awe and might. Take him seriously. For Moses, this was a huge concern. It was concerned that the next generation understands the story. Moses knew that there were only one generation away from losing their identity and going back into captivity. Isn't that a statement I'm going to repeat because we can relate? You imagine this. Moses knew that the people were one generation from losing their identity and going back into the captivity. I've heard people say, and I've heard it here at St. Peter's, we're going through the Bible? I've done this before. 
Why should I do it again? To be honest, my response is, I'm sorry I didn't do it sooner. So forgive me. We're doing the story because God wants his people to know the story. We're doing the story again and again, and maybe we'll do it again in perhaps seven years, because there were people here who weren't here decades ago when others went through it, and they desperately need to know the story. We're going through the story again because there are children who weren't even born yet the last time that people have gone through the whole Bible, and they desperately need to know the story. We know it to be true. We must. And our children, if they don't know the story and they don't live the story, well, what's next for our nation? How will our nation turn around? But not only that, each time you read the story, I know it doesn't change, but you have. And this is how Scripture works as a living book. Every time you go back into it, you're going to experience fresh discoveries, unlocking secrets that you couldn't have seen maybe a few years ago, maybe even months ago, but now you look at it and you, and you see this application to your life today and of the life God wants for you. There's a story of a person who was confronted. It was actually a pastor who was confronted by another person who said, you know what, my wife and I like to read books together. We read a novel and when we're done with it, we set it aside, we're done. It's interesting that the church, over two billion people gather together, together every week for over 2,000 years and they keep talking about the same book. Haven't you figured it out yet? <laughs> Tell me honestly, are you, are you truly seeing anything new in this book after all these years? The pastor responded, it just so happens I came across something new this morning, something that I've read many times before, and I saw something new today, and I'm excited about this discovery and what it means. That's the power of God's word. I think it's interesting that Moses decreed that the reading of the law would coincide with the canceling of debts. I don't think it's accidental. You see, when you see the one story from God from the very beginning, you're going to discover just how far God has gone to get us all back. The canceling of debts. Hmm. The canceling of what? Now, it's not my first time doing this. I've gone through the story before, and I am more excited today than I was the first time I've done it, more than any others, because I'm looking forward to discovering something new. Some of you that have been in my Bible classes, the classes maybe the subject matter I've done before, I've shared this with you. I take a different color pen, and when I go through some of the answers that I've already gone through, I write more answers that I've received from the people in the class or that have jumped off the pages for me. And so it becomes a, a greater a greater group of, of answers. I think God is going to show us something pretty remarkable. And it's because we have our hearts that are open to this. And if the seed of the word of God falls on a hard soil, it's not going to grow. If you're going to sit there and you're going to think, mm-mm, I know the Bible so well, I don't have to hear it anymore. Then the Word of God, I don't know what it's going to do. It's supposed to do what it's intended to do, but it's in hard soil. But if the seed falls on soft soil, it will be implanted, and it will produce fruit, and it will grow. It could be a great experience. And I do pray, Lord God, bless this congregation. Bless them as we all go through this on Sunday mornings, perhaps throughout the week. Bless them in their studying. Bless us in our hearing. May the word of God take great hold of our lives. Amen. That's probably the longest introduction to a sermon I've ever had. <laughs> the beginning of life as we know it.
at Sunday school, they were learning about God, how he created everything, including human beings, and Johnny was especially intent when his teacher told him how Eve was created out of one of Adam's ribs. Later that week, his mother noticed him lying on the ground as though he were ill, and he said, she said, Johnny, what's the matter? And Johnny responded, I have a pain in my side. I think I'm having a wife. <laughs> oh. oh, how about this one? It says in the Bible that God caused man to fall into a deep sleep, and he pulled out his brains and made the woman. That's my wife's version. <laughs> And lastly, there's another little boy who went to his grandmother's house and she was in the kitchen making lunch and he was thumbing through the pages of the family Bible and as it said, on the corner coffee table and he turned all the pages and he's looking through this and there were different bookmarks and suddenly a leaf fell out onto the floor without missing a beat. The little boy shouted out with excitement to his kitchen, Grandma, I think I found Adam's suit. I like that one. So today we begin chapter one. Uh, we're going to go through it. Now, Adam's suit may not fall off the pages, but I tell you what will, God's truth. God's truth will fall off the pages, and his truth will change your life. Anybody up for some life-changing truth today? I'd like you to watch this video, as it will explain a little bit more. <coughs> In the beginning, the earth was a dark, empty blob. God spoke and created the entire world. Light, sky, fish, birds, and animals. Then God said, let us make human beings in our own image, and created man out of dirt. And the man became a human being named Adam. After six days of work, God took a rest. God then put Adam in a garden where there were two trees, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God told Adam, eat from any tree except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat from it, you will die. Eventually, God caused the man to fall asleep, took out one of his ribs, and created a woman who Adam named Eve. God joined Adam and Eve together in marriage. Later, a serpent came and convinced Adam and Eve to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, saying they would become like God if they did. Eve took a bite, and then so did Adam. Because of this choice, God cursed the serpent as well as Adam and Eve and forced them out of the garden, away from the tree of life. Outside the garden, Adam and Eve had two sons, Cain and Abel. Cain was a farmer, Abel was a shepherd. When they made sacrifices, God accepted Abel's sacrifices of animals, but not Cain's sacrifice of crops. This made Cain so angry that he murdered Abel. People began to populate the entire earth, and wickedness and tragedy continued to spread. God was sad and regretted ever making human beings, and decided to wipe them from the face of the earth. God found one man. Noah, who walked faithfully. So God instructed Noah to build a giant boat called an ark and to take his entire family along with the male and female of every kind of animal onto the boat. For 40 days it rained and the entire earth was flooded, wiping out every living thing, plants, animals, and humans, all of it destroyed. Eventually, the flood stopped, and the ark came to rest on dry land. Noah and his family came out of the ark, and God made a promise that the entire earth would never again be completely flooded. God put a rainbow in the sky as a reminder of his promise, and God looked for someone who God could use to bless the entire world. Not sure it was an apple, but uh, you see this. And what we're going to be doing is you're going to see these posters and they'll start to populate the walls of our sanctuary, reminding us of the chapters and the story that God has been part and tried to 
remind us that we're part of his wonderful divine plan. The first sentence of the Bible is a powerful one. Many of you have already memorized it. It is, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You can see it in your story, in the book, if you brought your book. Uh, you know, that's on, on page one. You can also go ahead and you can check that out when you uh, look in the Bible, Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. And these first words of the story were already introduced to the main character of the story. It, it's God himself. Everyone and everything else finds life and breath in, and being in and through him. And how do I know this? Because the next seven words... God created the heavens and the earth. Now, I want to let you know this in this Genesis 1 and 2. It's not intended to be a science book. It, it's not, not something that's there to figure out exactly the time and the date of which everything was created and how it was created. But this particular book, this particular section is just to simply say, that it is what God has done. And if he wanted it to be a science book, he could have pulled that off too. But that's not the intent of Genesis 1 and 2. Now, from my study and my point of view, it's, it's okay, I think, to have the idea of what we call a young earth is, is perfectly wise and honorable. It, the idea that, which means that God created the earth in six earthbound days before it well, leaving our earth rather young, and sort of today. I mean, we don't know how it was created and what was done and how he made all things, but, you know, sometimes people say, well, what about the dinosaur bones, and what about the fossil records? And, and some people think, well, you know what? God could have created those too. It's sort of like how teenagers buy pants these days. Have you ever noticed? They buy a brand new pair of jeans that are whitewashed and have holes all over them. The brand new, but they look old. God could have done creation that way. The other idea is what they call a theistic evolution, which basically means that there were gaps in time. Or on or before Genesis 1 and 2, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was out without form, and so on. And then that time between might have been years and years, maybe a long time. The six days might represent longer than 24 hours. Some people think those things. Perhaps you'll have that discussion in your small group or in Bible class today. The point is, God's behind creation. The story starts out with a big bang, I like to say. God said it, and bang, there it was. And it's not an accident. It's not by chance. God started with nothing. He created everything that there is and everything that we can see and things that we can't see. And once you've concluded that there is a creator God, well then, if that's your conclusion, then God can do what he wants. Now what's the point of the whole creation? The question, and you might see it in your outline, why did God do all of this? Well, part of the answer comes down to a magnificent garden God created in Eden that the Bible tells us is, is kind of located by the Tigris and Euphrates River. They also talk about a couple other rivers there, but it, it's kind of like in the modern day Iraq. In fact, in your books, which is pretty neat, you have the front cover, which actually has a map. I think we have a map slide that we can show right now. You can see that where the Euphrates River and the Tigris River, that's where it is. Don't we have that map on one of the slides, Linda? And uh, what I've done in my Bible is I actually put a little tree there to remind me that's approximately where the Bible says the Garden of Eden is. Now, what we see is pretty remarkable next. We see that God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit now are excited and in that garden, they placed his crowning achievement, the apple of his eye. He created man. There's been billions and billions of galaxies, so many stars that we can't really count them. But he created man. And I, I'm one of these believers that think that 
His best work was done in the Midwest, Illinois. Can I get an amen to that, right? The best of the best are right here in front of me. His ultimate crowning achievement, he created them and he put them in the garden, man and woman, Adam and Eve. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit now is in community with man. He desires to come down and be with his people. It's like God's all about family. God's all about relationships. What matters most is his relationship with mankind. And God doesn't change. But God also wants Adam and Eve. He wants them to embrace this truth. They want, he wants people to embrace his vision. And he instills in Adam and Eve something that's different from the rest of creation. He instills in them the freedom to think, to have a free will, to give Adam and Eve a way to declare a choice, a, a decision that he put before them, two trees in the garden, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, if they ate from the tree of life, they, that would signal that they wanted to embrace God's vision forever. If they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that would be signaling to God that, well, they weren't embracing his vision. They were rejecting him, which leads us to the second part of the story, which is the fall. They ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And now it's a turning point of sorts. You see, their decision introduces sin to the human race and keeps us from that full community of God. The Bible tells us that the moment Adam and Eve took the forbidden fruit, and as I said earlier, we're not sure that it was apples. I don't think the type of fruit's all that important, but they knew it was forbidden. In fact, scholars have now concluded that they actually know what kind of fruit it is. They, they believe it was chocolate. <laughs> no, I'm just messing with you. It wasn't chocolate. But they did eat, and, and now it changed their nature. Sin now began to run in their bloodstreams. And now they have two choices signified by the name of the tree, the knowledge of good or the knowledge of evil. And before Adam and Eve and Eve, faced all the decisions with only one option in mind. Now they had two. They could do the right, good, moral thing for the sake of others. But there's something warring within them, the evil choice, which is immoral, all about getting what I want, what I want to experience, what's all the best for me. And we know what happened, don't we? It was the very first thing Adam and Eve did after they bit the forbidden fruit. We see the signs. It's written right there for us. The Bible says they clothed themselves with fig leaves. Why? Because they were now looking at each other instead of having good thoughts and honorable thoughts and, and pure thoughts. Now they felt shame for the first time. They felt vulnerable. And they began to cover themselves up. And now I think we've been defensive ever since. The Bible tells us that this single decision affects all of us today, no matter who they are. On page 7 in the story, or Genesis chapter 4, we're introduced to Adam and Eve's two boys, Cain and Abel. And God is pleased with Abel's offering, we see that, and, and, but not with Cain. And Cain has now two choices. Sound familiar? It should. The one choice is to say, <clears throat> I've learned from my brother Abel of how to bring a good sacrifice to God, how to be more pleasing to God. Now we know from the story that jealousy and anger rose up in Cain's spirit so much that God visits him and says, sin is crouching at your door desiring to have you, but you must rule over it. And that day Cain chose evil and killed his brother, signifying something really important signifying that sin's nature is passed down automatically through the seed of the parent, from the father to the son to the next generation. The psalmist says, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Psalm 51, 5. 
And this is a difficult biblical principle to wrap your head around because we like to think that men are and women are created good, that, that there's some good in all of us that we can do and achieve and be and please. But it's just like a hereditary bad cholesterol being passed down from parents to children. You can't stop it. It, it just happens. Well, this has been passed down. And it came all the way back from Adam, from that parent to the, their children to their children. So your parents and your parents' parents and your parents' 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 parents and so on. To this I would say, raise your hand if you're a human being. And I know for some of you it's questionable. Just kidding. <laughs> that means you're descended from Adam. It means from the womb of your mother you were conceived and born in the sinful nature. That sin keeps crouching at your door. That sin that keeps us from God in the garden because the way we treat people is not appropriate for the beautifulness of the garden. And here, what we see over and over again in humility, if humanity is left alone apart from God, all their expressions for evil will get worse and worse. And this is precisely what happened as the unfolding of the first pages of the Bible. From Cain killing his own brother to the time of the flood, sin escalates to the point of despicable. On the top of page 8 of Genesis chapter 6, the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth and that everything of the thoughts and the human heart was only evil from all the time, the Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. This is probably one of the most awful declarations that we can hear from the lips of God. He regrets that he made us. But the story doesn't end there. We're going to discover that God wants us back, even in the state of our wickedness. There are going to be many things, and I'll be able to give you insights as we unpack the Bible, as we take this journey over 31 weeks. And we're going to be able to understand that it's going to be amazing. But the one thing that's going to be a hard thing to be understanding and to really press forward home is why would, why would God, why, why does God's love Pursue us. Why does God love us and pursue us so severely in our state of rebellion against him? While we were yet sinners, God pursues us. Why does he do that? Which leads us to the next part of the story, the flood. A moment when we have a promise. A promise and a plan to get us back. And it's plan A. Plan A, to get us back. It makes a lot of sense, don't you think? In Genesis 6, the Lord God said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret I've made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Plan A, let's start over. Let's wipe out all the evil and begin again with the very best. That makes sense to me. So let's start out with the very best guy and see if we end up with a better product. And so that's what he does. Noah builds a gargantuan ark. He collects all the animals. The family closes up the doors. A massive flood hits the earth, wiping out every living creature except for Noah and his family and those aboard the ark. And when it's all over, they open the doors of the ark. They step out. They start to rebuild not from the seed of Adam, but from the seed of Noah. And they're going to see if this fixes the problem and leads us all back to God. Did plan A work? Getting us to find our way back to God? One real big problem. Noah and his family took the sin virus from Adam. They took it on the boat with them, and they walked off the boat with it. It was only a matter of time until sin raises his ugly head again, and it did in what happened after the flood. We see the story when Noah 
takes and drinks too much and he's exposed and there's shame from his sons. And it clearly tells us that the sin nature is still a resident within humanity. Plan A didn't work. As a matter of fact, and I paraphrase, this plan didn't work. We don't ever need to do a flood again. And he said he wouldn't flood it again. I remember the summer of 93, maybe some of you do too. In Illinois, we had record rainfall. The rain and the runoff was so great, the stream flooding occurred. I was probably less than a half mile from the Mississippi River living there. The flood displaced hundreds of thousands of people. And we were wondering if it would ever stop. And when it seemed dry where we were, it was still raining up north and still in the tributaries and in the great Mississippi, it was coming down. But God promised he wouldn't flood the earth again. He gave us a great rainbow. And I remember when that rain stopped and, and things began to dry up. And yes, I saw the rainbow and I was reminded of God's promise. But it wasn't because I deserved it. It was because of his promise. And it reminded me that God still desires to get us back. Back and restore that relationship. Sin continued to escalate. After Adam and again after Noah, we know about the Tower of Babel. We know that people got together and they wanted to build something as high and as mighty and that would reach the heavens. God steps in and graciously confuses their language. They can't save themselves. This is what I want to do. I want to intervene. And so he does. He does intervene in our story each and every day. And he desires to be part of your life and my life and the life of every person on this planet. But how will they know if they have not heard? He intervenes. Plan A didn't work. It's time for plan B. What will it take? to get Adam and Eve and all of humanity back into the garden of God. What will God do next? Remember the beginning of the message about Adam's suit falling off the page of the Bible? In that story, there was a clue to what God will do next. You know, that's Adam and Eve. If you look at Genesis chapter 3, you see he replaces a fig leaf with the skins of an animal. He, he covers their nakedness. He's signaling to us a solution that he has in mind that he's going to cover the, the sin and the shame and it's going to require the shedding of blood. Maybe you see where I'm going. The rest of the Bible is part of this story. It's, it's the promise that God keeps and continues to keep that makes possible that loving relationship that we have. And the story is just beginning. Plan B, which is a reality, and then there's plan A, which is his magnificent work. Watch and gather together as it unfolds the greatest story ever told, the story of our deliverance, of our Savior Jesus. He wants you. Amen. It is good news continue to encourage and keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus always and into life everlasting. Amen. Let us please stand and make confession of our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, 
the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Give us patience. Give patience to your church, to her ministers, and to us all. We are your people, and we trust in your word and your promises, even when our eyes do not see your hands at work. And when our hearts are tempted to anxiety, stress, or fear, grant that we would know the fullness of your peace. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our make us good soil, Lord, so that the seed that your word is planted in us may grow, flourish, and bear good fruit that you desire. Bless the work of all pastors, missionaries, and church workers who serve us in your name, that their ministry to us would bear good fruit. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our give to our president, Congress, and the leaders of our country and of our government wisdom to govern according to your word and commands that they would prove worthy of the trust that we have placed in them. Bring nations to peace and equip us to be good and responsible citizens. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. give wisdom and discernment to your people, O God, that we not give in to temptation, nor grow, nor grow weary of trusting your word and serving in willing obedience to your commands but delight in fulfilling our baptismal calling wherever we are. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. bless those who teach your word. Bless our Sunday school, our catechism classes, and everywhere where people are gathered to teach and learn your word. This day we especially lift up all small groups and our campaign now to go through your word. May our study strengthen our faith and direct us to make good confession before the world. Lord, in your mercy, give relief to the suffering, healing to the sick, peace to the troubled, comfort to those who grieve. Bless them with patience and endurance until you deliver them from their trials. Lord, in your mercy, help us to be good stewards of your creation to share what you have supplied with those in need, to support your work for the church in her mission here and throughout the world. All things are yours, Heavenly Father, for you have promised to supply us with all that we need when we need them. Help us to pray with confident hearts, trusting that you will provide all things needful and deliver us from all things harmful. Through Jesus Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. May be seated now for our message from the elder. Don't try to serve God with money. It's based on Matthew 6, 24. You may have heard that the love of money is the root of all evil. And you may have been told you must hate money. But money by itself isn't bad. After all, we need money to buy food, shelter, clothing, and many other necessities. However, if we pursue money at the expense of our relationship with God and, and our loved ones, we've crossed over into the love of money, which is a serious problem. As Jesus states in this verse, we can serve both God and money. When we obey God first, we can trust him with our finances and provisions. As the offering is being taken, we will sing at the same time our offertory hymn, Praise and Thanksgiving, the three verses. <laughs> Oh, it's not so cute. 
Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give them thanks and praise. Let us prepare our hearts to receive that which comes to us in bread and wine. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, for in creation you have shown your power and might, and still you preserve all that you have made. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, for in sending forth your own Son to suffer and die for us, you have revealed your mercy and your steadfast love. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, for by your power we have in us planted the seed of faith, and through Christ been restored as your own children, and you preserve us as your own through forgiveness and by the rich food that we receive in this blessed supper. Prepare our hearts and minds to receive it. And as we receive it, may faith take hold of all the blessings that are in and given with it. Forgiveness of sins, life and salvation, strength to live as you have called us to live. We pray this in the strong and precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we do proclaim the Lord's death until he comes, and we say, Amen. 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 As we come and we receive what he has for us, we are reminded and we pray. We are redeemed through the blood of the Lamb. We have been set apart by your own to live under you and your kingdom forevermore. We come to you this day in thanks and praise, confessing our whole faith, our birth, your birth, your death, your resurrection, your ascension into heaven, and your coming for the final judgment. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, in union with the Holy Spirit, and in Christ, now and forever. Teach us, O Lord, now, as our Lord and Savior taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. You may be seated.
body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you. May it keep you steadfast in the true faith until life everlasting. Now depart with joy and peace in your heart. Amen. Thanksgiving. Almighty God, we have approached the mystery of your presence this day, having heard your voice in your word, and having communed upon the blessed body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant that we may live within this blessed mystery, trusting not in what our eyes see, or the works of our hands, or what our minds comprehend but only in your Son, Jesus Christ, and in the salvation he accomplished for us. Keep us in this holy faith, and for all of our days, until the veil is lifted and we should behold you face to face, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And indeed, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. Our concluding hymn, Beautiful Savior. 